Hello, everyone. It is truly a great privilege to think with you today about the sacred science exhibit at the Dali Museum, which is where we would all be right now were worldwide circumstances different. Nevertheless, I'm grateful to be here in this medium. Let me tell you about what I'm going to do during this brief talk. First, I'm a professor of religion who teaches at a liberal arts college. And the liberal arts, like some of Dali's work in this exhibit perhaps, is a mode of engagement that is often poorly understood. So I, I will identify two key liberal arts issues that might help us think about some of the ideas in this wonderfully challenging exhibit. Second, sacred science features works from the Dalinian corpus that are not exhibited often enough in my view. Many of these pieces appear to be concerned with possible intersections of science and religion. I will add to our liberal arts ideas by mentioning two methodological operations from the study of religion that can contribute to our thinking about the images in this exhibit. I unfortunately will not provide a final word on any of these images or what they mean. I will, though, offer some thoughts that may help us position these works and this period wherein Dali developed his orientation of nuclear mysticism. So first, the liberal arts and Dali. The liberal arts stands for freedom of inquiry. It is not another term for the humanities and not about becoming politically liberal. It is rather an approach to learning and teaching and understanding that emphasizes self-knowledge and the process of becoming in relation in the world. This approach has at its core the drawing out of the self. Although it is an ancient modality, today the liberal arts are mostly associated with higher education and specifically with the liberal arts college. Herein there are two main hallmarks. First, the interconnectedness of knowledge or the acknowledgement that no way of knowing can be isolated from any other is quintessential. It is only through engaging with multiple forms together that wisdom can be achieved. Even when there don't seem like there are connections or that forms of knowledge are opposites, the interconnectedness of knowledge asks us to dig deeper. Legend has it from the book of Proverbs that wisdom has built her house and it stands on seven pillars. Curious students who want to achieve wisdom can do so by engaging with seven areas together. The interconnectedness of knowledge is something that I would say permeates Dali's work across his various periods, where he operates with the imagery of geometry, science, time, rhetoric, and so on. Relatedly, the second hallmark of the liberal arts is intertextuality. Similar to the interconnectedness of knowledge, there is a level of referentiality and responsiveness between texts and traditions across time and cultures. Ezra Pound's famous modernist dictum, make it new, did not necessarily mean to discard everything old. What it meant is to take a tradition or idea and respond to it from multiple angles and viewpoints. In order to see different visions and perhaps arrive at greater understanding, seen this way, intertextuality or the evoking of another voice in and through a new one is a means to induce human connection across boundaries. In my view, Dali's writing and painting exhibits a mode of intertextuality. For example, in this image from the current exhibit, the labyrinth, the snake figure, possibly from the Garden of Eden, um, possibly from alchemy, kind of entering the scene to the right. What all this means is that all traditions are on the table. There's a lot of reconfiguring and rereading, inventing mythology and story, reconciling opposites to make something new and pure. But purity here is tied to growth, action, learning, and knowledge, not to a backward state of ignorance or something isolable. It also means that images and stories are unstable and multivalent. The nature of symbols, as Dali uses them, is that they are malleable and consistent at the same time. And in the search for purity, 
one notices that there is no purity, no origins, no stability, only change and movement. Let's set ourselves up for that a little further by exploring the study of religion. As one of the oldest humanities disciplines, the study of religion is a result of not taking the world around us as inevitable. It is a mode of description, analysis, and interpretation as befits humanistic inquiry, not an advocacy project for any particular institution or dogmatic claims. It is popular to assume that thinking about religion is the same thing as affinity with a religious institution, or that one necessarily needs to trust in the existence of a higher order and purpose in order to think about religion at all. None of that is the case, by the way. In my own teaching, I distinguish between what I call big R religion, which is about established institutions, the world religions, for example, and small R religion, which is about how humans think, tell stories, and invent practices about where we came from, what we're doing here, and where we're going, as well as why any of that matters. We human beings are meaning-making creatures. The question is, how, why, and on what terms can we understand the human condition through attempting to understand how humans make meaning? Attending to that second configuration, small r religion, opens up a whole world of inquiry. And it allows us to think about Dali as more than a man who denounced and then embraced Catholicism, all the while using Catholic symbolism like the crucifixion, the Last Supper, or the Virgin Mary in his art. I would suggest that through Dali's work, we can position him as a seeker of knowledge, a questioner of what is taken for granted as reality, and a maker of meaning however provisional and or obscure. The works in sacred science betray this orientation. Two religious studies concepts will help us think about this further. The first concept is the awareness of self. This involves coming to understand one's situatedness in space and time, seeking to know more about who one is and why that matters. Self-awareness involves recognition that one is not the center of the universe or that one's perspective is not universal, but is the product of one's historical, social, cultural, and psychic circumstances. Self-knowledge is an elusive goal, however, as Dali knew, and probably accounts in part for his devotion to the work of Sigmund Freud and psychoanalysis. How can we understand ourselves if so much of what we do and who we are is hidden from ourselves and others? It makes sense to me then that one of the themes of the works on display in sacred science is the search for the knowledge of self, especially when the self is not at all obvious to the self. That Dali illustrated a folio for Freud's Mo Moses and monotheism is resonant with the self-reflection operative in the study of religion. Freud's penultimate book, considered by some to be allegorically autobiographical, features the proposition that Moses was not just an Israelite raised in an Egyptian household, but was Egyptian by birth and ethnicity and a follower of Akhenaten, an Egyptian pharaoh thought to have abandoned the polytheism of Egypt for a monotheistic outlook. This image from that folio is Dali's imagining of Freud's Moses and Akhenaten. Freud's work had an intertextual referent in the ar archeological expeditions at Tel El Amarna, which were ongoing at the time and provided much of the scientific evidential background for his reimaginative argument concerning the origins of biblical monotheism the work contains meditations on reconstructing history from what is lost and absent by using a psychoanalytic framework and is widely considered to be both seriously absurd and a serious proposal. The return of the repressed Egyptian Moses leads us to ask, do we know who we are? And you can see part of the meeting um, in this 
picture here in this image here has a person kind of in the center with a hole um, in him and, and uh, imagery from both from Egypt and Israelite imagery. Do we know who we are? What about our own pasts that are lost and then found? How do we connect those pasts with who we think we are and how we relate to others? In this exhibit, the images in Dali's Freud folio play with dreams, nightmares, and other means of realization that change Moses and change civilization. Awareness of self is related to a second operation in the study of religion, defamiliarization. This process is likely well known to fans of surrealist imagery. It involves how we unsettle what we take for granted and how we understand what we think of as strange. In religious studies, we ask how we might describe and see things we think we know as if we've not seen them before. Basically, how do we make the familiar strange? But defamiliarization is also a two-way street, for the strange also needs to be made familiar. Dali, structurally, is better at this than most artists, as he understands well semiotics, that is, the thinking about the relationship of symbols and meaning and the arbitrary affiliations that are formed between the two. Indeed, Dali wrote extensively about language and meaning. He tends to take familiar symbols and themes and render them utterly strange, just as he also has a way of taking the grotesque or what some may consider highly strange and bringing it into focus as that which is familiar and even comforting. When one uses defamiliarization, seemingly opposite ideas can combine to form something new and newly resonant, a third way. Defamiliarization in this exhibit is exemplified by the alchemy of the philosopher's folio. Dali was apparently no stranger to alchemy. I don't mean the caricature of the greedy alchemist turning metals into gold for profit but the ancient process of seeking secret knowledge and secret interconnections of knowledge in order to form more perfect and pure materials and more perfect and pure bodies, souls, and minds. In this series, Dali reimagines, defamiliarizes famous alchemical texts from around the world. Here is a representation of the famous emerald tablet by the mysterious Hermes Trimestigus from who we get the term hermeticism. We see alchemical pilgrims, little black figures, searching for gnosis, embedded jewels in the image, and what looks like a beveled mirror or mirrored jewel, featuring a symbolically hermaphroditic woman's torso, using a Dalinian motif of snails for breasts and perhaps the tree of gnosis for a head. The hermaphrodite is a key figure of the alchemical tradition representing the perfection and purification of the human body. As well, the mirror could point to the modern vision of the hermetic saying, as above, so below. Along with the union of opposites comes the decomposition of those components in order to make something else. If we take a look at the Ouroboros, another famous alchemical symbol, in Dali's rendition, we see the tail-eating dragon snake that represents eternity here, chopped into pieces, some in stages of oozing decomposition, and in the center of another jewel, a melting yin and yang. And with the phoenix, we can also see defamiliarization at work. We think we know the bird that rises from the ashes, but strange it becomes if it has a woman's body and what looks to be a peacock's head. And in her groin area, a window onto another world with mountains, a unicorn, and a figure that could be the alchemical Adam. In Gnosticism and alchemy, Adam was often portrayed as the very first knower among humans. We see here Dali taking familiar traditions and tropes and making them strange and foreign. In the process, challenging the viewer's cemented categories of existence and meaning. The philosopher's crucible represents the search, the path, and the goal. And the goal opens in the center to a vista 
showing new goals and new questions, and combining everything you see along the way. The elements on display in this sacred science exhibit, as I have briefly described them so far here, the drive toward self-knowledge, perfection, and purity, as well as the special union of opposites and the decomposition of various components used to bring perfection into being, are illustrative of Dali's self-professed nuclear mysticism. I'm actually surprised that more scholars of religion have not worked on Dali in this way. He had studied mystics all along and understood their mysticism as mediating and combining multiple ways of knowing. It was not a coincidence, moreover, that Dali developed his nuclear mystical approach in the United States, an approach in which he attempted to bring self-knowledge and self-questioning into conversation with modes of inquiry newly foregrounded in the modern sciences. I mention that because during this time, this confluence resulted in critical debates in this country, many of which are still ongoing. The rise of modern biblical and religious criticism, of which Freud was conscious, for example, when he wrote Mo Moses and Monotheism, made similar use of modern science. How do we balance claims to eternal truths with the contingencies of knowledge and history? Would science, as Nietzsche claimed it would, just become a surrogate for religion, another way of creating, controlling absolutes? Dolly hoped not. At the intersection of mysticism and science during this time was the potential to unmask all the hands at work in the production of truths and knowledge. This debate, which involves what historian of religion Erwin Goodenough a friend of Carl Jung's called Working Toward Mature Faith moved into the realm of psychology and religion. Again, this kind of thinking is beyond personal religious allegiance or affiliation with an institution. Myths, stories, and symbols that we craft both reflect and construct things about us as human beings. These myths, stories, and symbols also come from science. Dali understood that alchemy is in fact an ancient branch of science. And like the alchemical tradition, Dali knew that the best myths and stories not only challenge us to reevaluate ourselves and what we know, but also transform, transfigure, and transgress those firmly held truths, boundaries, and senses of self. This exhibit like Dali as both a person and artist, seems mad and is yet far from it. I hope you see it if you haven't already, and I hope you use it to read Dali's other works too. I've only briefly explored a few elements here, and there are to be sure many more. The curators have done a wonderful job in presenting the materials. In Sacred Science, Dali shows himself to be a seeker a questioner, a myth maker, and an exemplar of the liberal arts. These images are a great challenge for viewers in that, in my view, Dali may have achieved what he sought through all of the questioning and alchemical blending, immortality. There's more to say to be sure. I will end for now though. Thanks again, and I'll see you all for questions. <laughs>